the past three weeks, we discussed silent killers, basically sins that disunite the church. That was that's a fun series so far, huh? <laughs> um, well, look, since we did so good with those first three weeks, you got a bonus. We're going to add on to it. <laughs> I'm seeing some mixed reactions, some nervous laughs, some, some bowed heads. But we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna add on to it. The first three weeks we talked about, namely, gossip, divisiveness, and manipulation. Not necessarily topics that you, you know, we shout about, do backflips over, but there are topics that can help us mature in our walk with the Lord. And again, since we did so well with that, we add one more, and that is pride. <laughs> Who is, is amen? Who is right? Who is right? Let us pray. Most heavenly and most high God, we thank you, Father, for you. We thank you, God, because you are who you say you are, that you are love, and you demonstrated that love through Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you for your life. We thank you for your encouragement. We thank you for being our, our advocate, our intercessor. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for this time where we ask you to teach us and guide us into all truth. Lord, I ask, Father, that don't let me get in the way or my words get in the way but what you want to deliver to us, your people. We are open hearts and open minds to receive from you. It is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Pride, pride, pride. <laughs> We're talking about pride. So I'm going to start by just telling you some of the things that the Bible says about pride. And you can, let, you can, by raising your hands, let me know if this is something that you heard before. Um, James 4, 6. James 4, 6. God continues to give us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposed those who are proud, but he gives grace to those who are not. Anyone have heard that before? All right. That was James. He was basically quoting scripture from Proverbs 3, 34. How about this one? Luke 18, 14, uh, the B portion, the second portion of that. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Anyone heard that scripture? All right, a few more hands there. All right, all right. Um, Proverbs eleven two: 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Anyone heard that? All right, praise the Lord. We got, we got a strong one right there in the back. <laughs> Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction. My God. A haughty spirit before a fall. Anyone heard that one? Oh, we got a lot of hands on that one. <laughs> Amen. Let's do one more. Psalms, the 10th division, verse 4. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Oh, all right, all right. We got, we got a few in the back. All right, all right. These are all the different things that the Bible says about pride. Um, in my opinion and from my experience, pride is one of the most talked about things in the Bible. It's something that we are urged to avoid, urged to get rid of. So it's only sensible that we talk about how pride can affect us as a church, how pride affects us as a believer. Um, things that are applicable to helping us unite in the church also helps us in our lifestyles and our relationships and how we go about um, our daily living. Let me, add, let me ask y'all this. How do you define pride? Anyone want to yell anything out? Boastful, that's a good one. Any other, any other answers? Self-praise, self nice. Nice, Boast, boastful, self-praise. Self What's that? Self-righteous, that's very good. That's all. What's that? Scared of the truth, wow. <laughs> wow, scared of the truth. Anyone else? Ego-driven, wow, that's a good one. Sound like a TED Talk. Um, <laughs> anyone else? 
too strong-headed. Now that's something else. And you got a strong head, you got to watch out. <laughs> These are all good definitions of pride. And you see that there, when you heard definitions from other people that maybe you have not thought about, it resonated. They said, yeah, that could be pride. While pride may be all of those things, we're going to talk about five ways that pride manifests itself to cause division. Five ways, five ways. And thanks to my lovely wife, Juanita, we're only going to talk about two today. I originally wanted to do all five, but we're going to talk about two. She said, this is too tough of a message to try to stuff it in. So we're not going, we're not going to give you the pride buffet. I had to humble myself. <laughs> so we, we just go do, yeah, just do two. Um, but we will at least introduce what these are. Um, the five ways that pride manifests. Number one, lack of teachability. Simply call that a know-it-all. <laughs> My goodness. Can't tell them nothing. <laughs> nothing. Two, self-sufficiency. They got it all. They got it all. Self-righteousness. Someone, someone said self-righteousness. Right all the time. Can't do no wrong. And if they did something wrong, it's right because they did it. <laughs> uh, Self-seeking. We had someone that said something similar to that. Self-seeking. They got to get it all. Spiritual indifference. Now, that's interesting. Spiritual indifference. Don't care at all. All of these things are ways that pride manifests that cause us to be disunited as a body. Now, we're going to start with the first one, which is pride, lack of teachability. If you need another definition besides the wonderful colloquialisms that we have up here, I would, I would suggest that lack of teachability could be considered as closed-minded or strong-headed. Closed-minded to learning and growing beyond limitations. Closed-minded to learning and growing beyond limitations. Um, I will ask for 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, if you can find that in your phones or your Bibles. Um, and just so I know that you're with me, raise them in the air. Raise them like you really do care. Amen. Amen. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through Nine. And if we may, yep, that's awesome. And for those of you online, we thank God for you. Thank you for joining. If it, even if it is from Bedside Baptist or wherever you may be, we do thank God for you. Um, so we'll read this. I'll read this. Uh, going from verse 1 through verse 9. But mark this. Take note of this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, my goodness, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Help us, Lord. Have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes my goodness, they worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women. I know we don't have none of those here. D with women, they go. <laughs> Who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Here we go right here on verse 7. This is what we're going to index on. Always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. My God. Always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And it goes on to say, just as Janus and John Brace, or John Brees opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. 
They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading. Um, Even though this text is the basis for the topic of um, lack of teachability, you'll see how this text also serves as a threat for the other points. But the reason we are discussing this today is for verse 7. Um, I know there's some, some interesting things in verse 8 and 9 where you talk about Janice and John Breeze, and I had to do a little bit of research on that myself because those, this is the only time these names are mentioned in the Bible. And historical um, you know, studies and Jewish tradition refers these to um, the magicians and the wise, the magicians and kind of like the wise men that were on Pharaoh's side that was opposing Moses. So if you remember when Moses, you know, had Aaron and they said, throw down the rod and they turned to the big snake and then they said, oh, we could do the same thing. These people were from, from that, that crew. Um, just a little side note. Um, but the reason why Paul referenced them is, is that these people had a little bit of abilities, even though it was demonic. <laughs> and they opposed God. Um, and that's something when we operate in pride, we become danger, in danger of. We, we take our little bit of ability that we have, and instead of bowing and being humble to, to see the truth, to receive the truth of God, we want to hold on to our, our stuff. Um, but the thing that we need to recognize when we talk about the lack of teachability and why this is such an issue um, for the church is that if you have someone closed-minded to learning and, and, and even going beyond their limitations, it's going to stunt the growth of those around them. It's going to make it hard for us to be on one accord. It's going to cause some discomfort when we try to unite. It states, when you go through the text, it's very interesting that some of the things that was called out in our audience today are some of the very things that was listed in that scripture. You know, we, 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 we talked about the, the, the strong-headed and the boastful and all of those things. The Bible added lovers of themselves and, and, and being conceited. I was surprised that we didn't hear that one. But I would suggest to you that not only the common terms that we know are, or the synonyms for pride are applicable, but literally all of those things that were listed. Because, for example, if you go back, you know, so for, for instance, someone uh, give me one of the, the words here and we can see how it connects to pride. Someone just yell out one of them. One Ungrateful. Of the, Ungrateful. See? If a, person, <laughs> if a person thinks that they, you know, they accomplished it all on their own, they did it themselves, what are they going to be thankful about? Because they don't feel like they need nobody and they don't need nothing. They got it on their own. So pride is really a basis or a foundation for, in my opinion, most willing sin. Because in essence, you are saying that I'm deciding to do something that God said is not good for me. So my way is better than God's way. Or I'm preferring this direction over God direction. So from my perspective, I would say that pride is the basis from any willing known sin. So that means that, hey, pride is something that we all can learn about because we've all have sinned <laughs> and come short and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? Amen. 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 So, you know, Paul was teaching Timothy as he was preparing him to, you know, pastor church and lead God's people. Um, he was teaching them on how to deal in the previous chapters with false teachers and those who have not really come into the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. He was teaching them how to be gentle, not to just argue. At some point in time, you realize it's like when you're talking to a wall. You know, and sometimes there's some constructive conflict, constructive conversation where you got two different opinions and you might grow to understanding, but other times it's just bickering. And, and, and Paul said, look, that's a bad example and it's a waste of your time. Don't do that. Um, but when he came over to chapter 3, he's like, look, I know I'm telling you to do all of this stuff, but in essence, it's going to be hard. Because the times that we live in today, and this is back, you know, almost 2,000 years ago, um, 
they were referring to that as the last days. So now further along where we are, it's the last, last days. <laughs> okay? So while they were dealing with those challenges back then, it's even worse now. Just, you know, so you said back then we got people that's loving themselves. I mean, just think about it. You know, look, I'm going to live my best life. If it don't bring me joy, if it don't bring me this, I, they don't got, it's no space for it for me. You know, um, lovers of money, all of these different things that are mentioned here. But he was letting them know this is the environment as a believer that, number one, you have to watch out for. But you got to also be careful that you don't become. Yeah. Amen. And. The challenge is when we get to any of those characteristics of pride, being boastful or conceited or um, loving ourselves too much, it impedes our ability to learn. If you think you're the best (laughs) and you don't feel like there's no room to get better, why would you learn? Or if you love yourself so much that you can't really see anybody else on your level, (laughs) How often are you, how open are you going to be to, to feedback, you know? Um, and that's really the thing that is, is, is very applicable for us, even in a church. Um, you know, we all have our different skills, our different abilities. We all have things that we're good at, all of that good stuff. But it does not mean that we can't get better. It does not mean that we don't need each other, you know, uh, just from, 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 you know, it's not a bunch of brothers in here, but for, for you know, for, for my single brothers, you know, you, you, if you didn't do it the all the way holy way and just dating and <laughs> married to your wife, um, you, might, you might come into a relationship uh, with your wife and say, well, hey, what I, when I did this for these other women, that worked. <laughs> so if it worked for them, <laughs> it should work for you. It don't work that way, bro. <laughs> it don't work that way. It don't. Um, you know, you got to understand and be humble to listen to your wife, to be open to, for feedback, open to grow, open to do something different. Regardless of what your track record was, we talking about what your track record need to be. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, I mean, and, and that's just, it's a thing of pride. And it's not that, you know, you might be wrong about your ability or your history and this and that, but you wrong for not being willing to grow. Yeah. And anything that doesn't continue to grow eventually dies. Yeah. Likewise, when we stop growing together, when we stop, you know, being willing to support each other and learn and let go of pride, it causes death. It causes things to be halted, things to not to grow in the way that God has intended. Now, the Bible reinforces that in order to be taught, you need to be humble. In Psalms 25, verse 9, it tells us that the Lord leads the humble in what is right, and he teaches the humble his way. If you replace humble with pride, you're missing out. You won't get taught. That's, that's the fundamental part of it. And that's what Paul was teaching Timothy. Because of their pride, they were preventing themselves from receiving and walking into the instruction of the Lord. They were too blindsided about what they thought and who they were and what they wanted, that they were unable to see what the Lord was trying to do in their lives. Other ways that pride causes us to be unteachable is that Sometimes it causes us to disvalue a lesson because of the person who's bringing a lesson. Uh, you know, pa- Pastor Ron last Sunday, and it was interesting. I was like, why is he doing this? But we need to be reminded. He's like, look, he was like, some of y'all might look at me this way and that. He's like, I'm, I'm not trying to get nothing out of you. <laughs> I'm just trying to give you the truth of God's word. And he said, if God can use a donkey, Surely he could use me, you know, and, and that's the thing. Sometimes because we have reached to a certain stature in life, we got certain initials behind our name, certain degrees, certain number of zeros in our bank account because we live in a certain neighborhood, you know, uh, we, we associate with certain organizations, affiliations, whatever it may be, that it causes us to shun away from 
other people as looking at them as a source of something I can learn to get something from. You know, and, and that's, that's interesting because when we consider outside of Jesus, the wisest man in the Bible, Solomon, Solomon, he studied things that some of us don't even think about. He talked about how he studied ants. Solomon, the one who got divine wisdom from the Lord, took the time to study something that we consider some of the most insignificant. Um, he was one of, you know, he's known his, historically to be an a, a, a expert, uh, what is it, botanist, you know, just really into plants and trees and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah he, he studied plants, he studied trees, he studied all of these things that sometimes we look over, we walk by and don't pay any attention to, and he got wisdom out of that. So likewise, if, if God could use a donkey, if God could use ants, could use plants, trees, and all these different things, he can use anybody he want to use. Because quite frankly, none of us are perfect vessels. Now, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but you know, just like a clock, a broke clock is right twice a day, so you might only be able to listen to him twice a day. <laughs> But, but don't be close to that, that possibility of them being right them two times a day, you know. <laughs> Amen. You know, that's what we have the Word of God. We have the Spirit to test things against. But when we completely close our ears, we can miss out. You know, uh, I, I myself, I, I learn sometimes from my children, you know. Um, you, know uh, you know, like my son Justice, for example, um, when I was looking to get promoted in one of my uh, previous positions, you know, I was, he heard, overheard me talking, and he was like, how do you know you're going to be promoted? It's <laughs> like, huh. I was like, well, it's <laughs> like, well, you know, that's what my manager committed to, and blah, blah, blah. He's like, oh, but how do you know? It's like, uh, I mean, I guess I'm just going based off of what they said, but yeah, I technically really don't know. And the reason why that was important, because something happened with a change in leadership. And then that promise wasn't a promise anymore. <laughs> and then I had to, you know, switch into a different team. And eventually God blessed me to, to go to another company. But the point of it is, is that sometimes we put our stock in things that, <laughs> yeah, you, we, we count them eggs before they hatch. <laughs> you know, and that's something that, you know, learn, 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 learn from my son, Justice. Um, you know, one time my, my nephew, when I had him for a while, and for some reason, we was playing something like hide and seek, but it was in the dark. And uh, yeah, random stuff guys do. I can't explain it. But, <laughs> but in essence, the lights was off. And he was like, you know, unk, whatever he called me. He said, I bet, I bet I can find you. I was like, how you go find me? It's dark in here. You can't find me, man. He said, I bet you I can. He said, I was like, Chris, you ain't going to find me, man. Said, yes, I am. And as the story went, he was getting closer and closer and closer. And then he found me. I'm like, Chris, man, you a ninja. How did you figure that out? He was like, well, I didn't see you, but I followed your voice. That's it. He kept me talking. You're right. You're right. But, but isn't that applicable to us with our walk with the Lord? Shouldn't we be humble enough to say, even though if I don't see a way, if I don't see how this is going to work out, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow with this, I want to keep talking to the Lord. I want to keep hearing his voice, however way it's going to come. And if I follow his voice, I'm going to find him in movement. I'm going to find him in acting. I'm going to find him in bringing forth whatever solution he got. Learn it from a kid. <laughs> you know? Um, so, again, don't cut out on your blessings. Don't cut out on your ability to grow beyond limitations because you're limiting your sources of learning. You know, just think about this, you know, and I'm not going to argue who the GOAT. There's a lot depending on, you know, generations for basketball and stuff like that. But I can't say Michael Jordan. I, I'm, I'm just going to say him first. <laughs> and I will also say LeBron James. And not just them two. I mean, in other sports, arena, and different ones. They, at some point in time, were considered the best at their craft. But here's the thing. They had trainers, not just coaches for the team. They got trainers to help them on specific things that they wanted to get better at. So consider that the best facts, the best in whatever this is, they still understood that they needed to be taught. 
that someone who arguably would not have stood a chance if they played one-on-one or they went against each other, someone that did not qualify, nor were they on the same level, if you will, as far as skills, but that person had an insight. They had something that could help them grow beyond their current limitations, and they were willing to humble themselves to receive that teaching. And that's the way we have to see things here. We can all learn from each other. We can all help each other. God has called us to esteem one another, to to help build one another. And when we are standoffish or we sit back in pride, well, I could have did that better than that. (laughs) You know, or I don't know why they do that anyway. You know, when we, we get back in those judgmental lenses, we miss out on the ability to see like, well, hey, maybe that person did something different. But look, maybe I should learn from that because I can perhaps expand what I'm doing today. Proverbs 29.1 tells us, He who is often reproved, Proverbs 29.1, yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. My goodness. Strong-headed, stiff neck. (laughs) Strong-headed, stiff neck. And that's the thing, right? Like if, if, our, if our neck is so stiff in one direction because we're too proud to understand that there's potential other alternatives or other ways to view something, that there's perhaps what I knew got me to this point, but God is trying to take me a little bit further, so I need to be pruned, I need to be taught, I need to be mentored, we stiff neck. So when that next challenge comes along, we get sideswiped because we're looking in this direction, but God is trying to get us to look in this direction. Or he's trying to get us to look up. But we're so focused on what happened in yesteryear and how we got here and how we did this that we lose our abilities to be flexible. We stiff neck. And Proverbs says, look, it'll suddenly be broken and beyond healing. So some things that got messed up in our life because we wasn't willing to change. (laughs) We wasn't willing to learn or adjust. Prideful, lack of teachability. Now, people who aren't teachable oftentimes lead towards being self-sufficient. And that brings us to our next point, pride, self-sufficiency. Now, I know in our summary, we said self-sufficiency, we called it got it all. But if I had to offer a definition, I would say, the thought that you can maintain yourself without aid, maintain yourself without help. Maintain oneself without aid. That's how we define the self-sufficiency. Uh, if we can go to Romans 12, chapter 3. Romans 12, chapter 3. And I know self-sufficiency is an interesting word because in a world system, Self-sufficiency is really a good thing. You know, well, you know, she got her own car. She got her own job. I-N-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-T. Do you know what that means? You know, it's, it's, it's something that is celebrated in the world. And certainly, you know, we are to do things and, you know, earn our money and, and, and do different things like that. But that's not to cause us to operate in pride. Because no matter how hard you work, how many degrees you got, how many properties, all these different things, you only have those by the grace of God. You can't even tell yourself to breathe unless God lets you breathe. (laughs) So if you can't give yourself a breath, how do you think you gave yourself this wondrous life (laughs) that you have? Amen? You know, and that's the thing is that sometimes we get to the point where we think we got here by ourselves. Yeah, and because of us and our efforts and things like that. But no one has gotten anywhere without the help from somebody. God first. We all standing here on the shoulders of our forefathers. Generations that have sacrificed for us that never knew us and never would meet us. But they made sacrifices that the generations after them would not have to go through the stuff that they went through. Our parents took jobs and did certain things that they would never want us to do, but they suffered. They gave up dreams. They did these different things so our life would be better. You know, teachers, you know, teachers have gave up careers to to pursue more money because they had a heart for our children to better our society. 
someone somewhere down the line has sacrificed for us. And to come up with a pompous attitude to be like, I did it all on my own, that's pride. <laughs> that's pride. So Romans 12, 3, and it reads, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has. I'll read it from here. God, God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body, one body, with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, through many, I mean, though many, form one body. That's one body. And each member belongs to all the others. Wow. Wow. We are members of one body. Members of one body. Um, and I think sometimes we feel that we are one body and we just helping out the members. <laughs> we get it in reverse. We get it in <laughs> reverse. And, and, and Paul here, and it's interesting, and we was talking earlier about how the world celebrates, you know, um, self-sufficiency and things like that. But a couple of verses right up, Paul tells us, he's like, look, you got to change your thinking. He said, don't be conformed to this world, <laughs> but you got to renew your mind. And that's the thing. We can't take the same principles that the world and society teaches us and think that's going to work in a church. Amen. That that's going to work, <laughs> you know, in the body of Christ. Because oftentimes they're in direct opposite. The world tells us to get all you can. The word tells us to give all we can. It's just, it's just a different dichotomy. It's a different understanding. And Paul even stating this. He's like, look, I'm going I'm to I'm help you out <laughs> with pride. But before I tell you about not being prideful, first understand this. It's by the grace, the grace given me. And that's what we can never forget. It is the, by the grace of God that you even sitting in that seat. It's by the grace of God that you woke up this morning. It's by the grace of God that even if you got a pain in your left pinky toe, you still got a left pinky toe. <laughs> Amen. It's by the grace of God. It's by the grace of God. You know, um, it, it, and it's because in this world, this fallen world, it's sometimes you can't make sense out of stuff. Bad things can happen to good people, good things that can happen to bad people. But it's God's grace that sustains us. Regardless if it's good or if it's bad, if we understand it or it's not, we have a God that loves us and can, helps us and sustains us through it all. So Paul said it's by the grace, not that I earned, not that I went and found and took, but it was giving to me. So it's by his grace, but that, you didn't get that grace on your own. It's grace that God has given us. That I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly then you ought, then you should. My goodness. So he's like, yeah, okay, that's cool. You're thinking about yourself and you got this and that, but hold on. <laughs> don't, don't think too much of yourself. And he said, and a way around that is rather thinking with sober judgment. Um, you know, and, and when you look at sober, it's just basically, it's basically conservative. It's, it's, it's something that's sensible. Um, you think of the opposite of sober, you can think about being drunk. Some, some of us, you know, we, we, we like, you know, certain, a certain singer, and we'd be like, I woke up like this. And, uh, <laughs> and we get drunk off of whatever we think we got going on for ourselves, you know, whatever the accolades are, how we, how we look, the, the associations we have, um, whatever it is, we get drunk off the things that's around us. But that's not for us to, to boast in. That's not something for us to put our confidence or faith in. It is by the grace of God that we are here today. But rather, you think of yourself with sober judgment, and he said, in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of us. And that's important because it's telling us, and, and pride sometimes can work in the opposite direction, 
And we won't talk about that too much in this series, but pride can sometimes cause us to disqualify ourselves because we think that we, we, too, we, not, we too underqualify for God to use. We think our situation is too bad for God to do something with. So some, sometimes pride can work in the other direction. So that's why it's important for us to remember faith, to remember that our faith isn't in ourselves, our faith is in God, which without is impossible to please him. But when we believe in God and in his ability, he is truly a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And faith we all have. We all have the faith issued out by God's grace. And because of that, we have these things that sometimes we mistakenly get self-sufficient in. So the, the warning for us is to recognize that all we have is from God. To glorify God, not not ourselves, not do what we want. All we have from God is to glorify God, and here it is, and to serve his people. Oh, wow. (laughs) Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Sabrina. One hand clap. Serve his people. We don't want to hear that. God bless him with this this, this dope Lexus. I ain't taking nobody to church. Mess up my seats. (laughs) You know, yeah, I mean, but, but that's it. You know, God has blessed us to be a blessing. He didn't just give you that so you can look good and smell good and act good. He gave you that so you can help somebody else so they, too, can see your good works and glorify him in heaven. Amen. Amen. If we get our eyes off ourselves and on somebody else, God can bless us. He can use us. Sometimes we don't got what we've been praying for because we're in a way. You know, James said we ask, but we ask amiss because we ask to satisfy our own own selfish desires. You you know, so and that's and that's and that's and that's what Paul is is warning us here. He's like, look, no matter how great you think you are, (laughs) you still need somebody else. You can be an awesome muscular arm. But if you just an arm over there and a body is all the way over here, <laughs> you, you going to look like a nice strong arm, but you ain't doing nothing. you just holding up space, you know. And the body is moving along, but it's crippled. So you really messed up, and the body is crippled because you are allowing pride to detach you from the body. We need each other. Bless the name of the Lord. And, you know, I'm going to let y'all out a little early. Um, <laughs> yeah, check the time. But, no, but it, it, it's, it's, it's important, though, because the risk that comes with that self-sufficiency, thinking that, you know, we got whatever we got on our own, we don't need nobody, we did this by ourselves, it leads us to being self-righteous. Oh, self-righteous. But we got to wait till next Sunday to talk about that. <laughs> oh, bless the Lord. Um, oh, let's get a Lord a hand clap. I know it's a little confusion on that. We can get a Lord a hand praise. <laughs> um, well, we, 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 do, we do thank the Lord, though, for, for this series. I know it's not a fun series, and let's jump up and backflip and high five. But... It's good to know the things that God hates. It's good to know the things that God is displeased in so we can curtail and grow and change what we're doing so we can be pleasing unto the Lord. And, you know, as we mentioned, next week we're going to cover self-righteousness. They live it all. You know, they just do everything right. Self-seeking. There it is right there. Get it all. They got to get it all. Praise, recognition, all that stuff. And spiritual indifference. Don't care at all. If you don't think you don't need nobody, why would you care about them? So all of these things, in one way or the other, tie in together. And they're manifestations of pride. Pride ain't all the time just walking around snooty with your chest out and your head up, you know, in a too tight shirt. No. (laughs) No. Pride manifests in ways sometimes that we, we, you know, we overlook. We overlook, you know. So, like I said, I had to humble myself today because we would have been up here for probably another 40 minutes if I went to these other three, <laughs> three points. But I humbled myself and listened to my wife. So let's give her a hand clap so y'all can get out and get something to eat. <laughs> Somebody root you up. <laughs> um, well, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. We thank God for his word. Hopefully that was something that was helpful to all of us. And, and don't just be hearers. 
Amen. Let's also put this in practice so we don't deceive ourselves. Um, pride affects us in ways that we underestimate. And sometimes, even as unbelievers, it causes us not to come to the Lord because we see things that we may not agree with in a church or in the lives of other believers or quite frankly, just don't feel like they see the need to. But I want to encourage even those online, if you are not saved, to remember some of the things that we talked about in this service on how God loved us so much that Jesus set aside everything, the glory he had with God from the beginning. He emptied himself of his divinity. He put on flesh. And he didn't come as a king. He came humbly to save us. Save us from what? Save us from missing out what God has for us. Save us from sin, which is missing God's mark, missing the way that God has designed us to live. And it's not just this life that we're concerned about. It's the life after this life. And Jesus raising from the dead proved to us that there is a life after this. Because he didn't just flatline and came back. He came back as the firstborn of the resurrection, the prototype of what we will be.